the seasons keep changing These reasons keep fading away Day by day, day by day, day by day Welcome to The Mystic and the Skeptic, the show that asks the tough questions and explores different alternatives to today's pressing issues, theories, or enigmas. A podcast devoted to the exploration of all things mystical, philosophical, scientific, political, conspiratorial, and cosmic. Join us in an exploration of the mystic skeptic mind space. In this week's show, our guest is Dr. Jonathan Roth. He's a military historian and professor in the History Department at San Jose State University. He was born and raised in San Francisco Bay Area. He received his BA in Near Eastern Studies from UC Berkeley in 1979. After a year of studying Assyriology in Germany under a Fulbright scholarship, he moved to New York City, where he worked for several years in publishing and served for six years in the New York Army National Guard. Well, his academic specialties are ancient military history, especially that of the Roman Imperial Army, first century Judaism and Christianity from a historical perspective, and race and ethnicity in antiquity. Some of his books include Logistics of the Roman Army at War and Roman Warfare, he also has a lecture for the great courses on war and world history. Dr. Rott has appeared multiple times on the History Channel and various programs dealing with ancient warfare. Welcome to the show, Dr. Rott. Thank you. Yeah, I have to mention my uh, other alma mater, Columbia, where I got my PhD in 1991. Our topic today is Jews and Christians in the Roman Army, Perceptions and Realities. And uh, this is based on a lecture you gave uh, years back uh, in Houston at the Museum of Natural Science. And I was there, and I was very fascinated with your presentation, so we're glad to have you back on the... Well, I interviewed you then, and now I'm glad to interview you again and to um, expand a little bit more on uh, what you uh, shared with us back then. That's great. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Uh, can you paint a picture of the role of race and ethnicity in the ancient military um, times, and how was it like in the Roman imperial rule for people from different ethnic groups to participate in their in their army? Right. So the um, organizing uh, military units around ethnic groups, and particularly foreign ethnic groups, goes way back in military history. So it's um, the Jews, for example, uh, when the Assyrians conquered them, when the Babylonians conquered them, their royal army, their units, were inco incorporated into those militaries. So they continued to serve as Jews. And subsequently, we find, for example, Jews serving in the Egyptian army, um, in the Persian army, as Jews. Uh, conversely, you know, we find in the Jewish army, when they had a king kingdom, um, Greek soldiers or uh, other foreign soldiers. In fact, in Herod's army, there were Germans who served. So um, having uh, military units organized around ethnic groups was common, and um, the Romans really institutionalized it. So uh, the legions uh, were made up of Roman citizens. And uh, the auxiliaries, what they call the auxiliaries, cohorts, and uh, cavalry units were made up of other ethnic groups. So, um, you know, often but not always, those ethnic groups would, um, you know, have their name in the unit name. So you'd have a, the fifth cohort of Gauls or the first so the archer unit of Syrians and, and like that. Uh, so, you know, in ancient times, uh, we don't have them using race in the sense we do. So, um, you know, we don't have them separating people out by, say, skin color or appearance. But it was done according to their ethnicity, and often they didn't really have a word that we is the same as our race, but the word that we translated race, something like ethnicity or nation, they would apply to other groups than themselves. What are these the the period that we're talking about? Um, in my notes, 
Um, you mentioned the late Republic to the fifth century. So what is the late Republic and is there other periods in between? Yeah. So when uh, historians talk about the late Roman Republic, generally date from after 100 BC. And uh, uh, this is a period where uh, the Roman army goes from being a citizen militia to being a professional military force. And it, it's still officially a citizen militia, but they allow people without property, the so-called proletarians, to fight. And uh, that turns the army into a professional army. It's the beginning of the fall of the power of the Roman Senate and, uh, and, and the assemblies, beginning of the rise of warlords like Sulla and Pompey, and then, of course, Caesar, leading to the civil wars. And then in 30 BC, um, you know, uh, Octavian, who becomes Augustus, Caesar um, establishes what we as historians call the Roman Empire, although he insisted he was restoring the Roman Republic. Um, that's the period that we start then, um, the imperial period. So, you know, um, from a military point of view, the legion is really established in its sort of classical form uh, by about 100 BC and then continues uh, to about 200, 300 BC. And then, you know, the Roman army, although the units change and so forth, it continues as a professional army right down into the fall of the Western Empire in the 5th century and then continues on in the Eastern Empire, we call the Byzantine Empire. Um, the auxiliaries are part of the army really right down into that period where we start the late empire, really the 4th century, when the army is reorganized. Uh, but there, then, we get another type of ethnicity where foreign troops are brought in as so-called veterans. So, all the way through, when we talk about the Roman army, we're talking about two parts, you know, people who are either legally Roman citizens, um, and in 212 AD, everybody in the Roman Empire, including Jews and Christians, become Roman citizens. But then, you know, there's also a sense of Romanness, being an ethnic Roman, uh, versus being a foreigner, whether you're a citizen or not. And that's reflected in their military service. So can you tell us about the motivations for people joining the Roman army? Was it um, when they conquered a people, they incorporated them, or did they hire them as mercenaries? Did they have all kinds of different reasons to, to join the army? Uh, was it just to, to, to pay their bills and, and take care of their families, or were they forced as slaves, like, or is it all of the above? Yeah. Right. So the Romans, um, like the Greeks, they never used slave soldiers. I mean, slave soldiers are known in history. But, uh, uh, in, in, you know, the, the uh, army, although technically there was still a draft, and occasionally, um, you know, when there was an emergency, you know, an invasion or something, a civil war, uh, the Romans did use the draft. They conscripted people. But only citizens were eligible for the draft. And um, so foreigners were never drafted. Uh, and in practice, uh, virtually everyone in the Roman army after 100 B.C. Uh, was a volunteer and, until the late empire. So in the late empire, they start to use hereditary uh, units. So that is, the children of soldiers are recruited. But um, other than that, throughout most of this period, people are volunteers and uh, People volunteer for all sorts of reasons then, as they do now. Uh, some of them, obviously, are looking, you know, to make a living. You know, in the late Republic and early Empire, uh, pay for the soldiers was pretty good. I mean, it was the same as you'd get for a skilled, lab a skilled laborer. Uh, there was also um, opportunities for advancement uh, within the army. The, the Roman army, although the high officers were recruited from the aristocracy, uh, there was uh, opportunity to move up. You could become a centurion, uh, which was very well paid, very prestigious. And in some rare cases, we have people going, you know, from being a centurion to the lower echelons of, of the nobility. And um, uh, foreigners who served in the military could get citizenship for themselves and their families. So that was a very important motivation because uh, citizenship, for example, 
uh, meant you weren't, you couldn't be tortured. Um, you look at what happened to, say, Jesus, who was not a citizen, and Paul, who was a citizen. So Jesus, when he's arrested, is whipped, tortured, crucified. Uh, Paul, when they, you know, a soldier actually is whipping him, and he says, oh, by the way, I'm a citizen, and, and they have to stop whipping him. In fact, the, the soldier's quite alarmed because he might get in trouble. And, um, and then, of course, a citizen couldn't be crucified either. And, uh, so, um, and there were other privileges. So, uh, and then, you know, like today, some people um, left their villages or, or, or cities and went in the military for adventure. And, uh, you know, some people like uh, military life, and uh, that it was the same then as it is now. So when we talk about Jews and Christians in the Roman army, are these terms anachronisms for that time period? Uh, some of the research that I've done is... Uh, there was flu fluidity between the two groups, and there was cross pollination. Um, so, what do you think about that? Well, to 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 some extent, I mean, um, particularly in the first century, and the you know, obviously, um, initially, you know, Jesus and all the apostles were Jews, and it was uh, initially a Jewish, you know, sect, a group. Um, you know, there's no reason to think that uh, the Romans really distinguished between Jews and Christians uh, very early on, um, and there certainly was some fluidity. Uh, many of the uh, Christians, like Peter or James, Jesus' brother, um, insisted uh, that uh, Christians had to be circumcised and eat kosher food, and it was Paul, who was a Jew and, of course, uh, actually a Pharisee, who uh, said, no, that's not true. Um, and there were Jewish Christians for several centuries, um, but in the, probably in the 80s AD, most people think uh, there was a split. Uh, you know, Jews uh, initiated uh, a policy, the uh, part of their liturgy, to differentiate themselves from the Christians. At some point in the first century, say between the 60s and 100, Christianity was made illegal. Uh, it was a death penalty to be a Christian, but Judaism was legal. And uh, conversely, after the temple was destroyed, Jews had to pay a tax uh, to the Romans uh, and uh, special taxes as punishment for revolting. And uh, that all Christians didn't have to pay that. So after, say, the 80s or 90s, there was certainly a distinction. Now, that doesn't mean that there wasn't a certain going back and forth. I mean, people did convert uh, from one to the other, but at that point, say, in the second, third century, it was not that different than, say, a pagan becoming Jewish or becoming Christian or vice versa. So um, I think, you know, there was a distinction. Now, um, in the late Republic, Jews were given... Um, uh, freedom from conscription, because uh, actually during the civil wars, uh, the Romans did sometimes conscript uh, non-Romans uh, and uh, bring ethnic groups into their military. This was abandoned uh, when the empire started, but uh, during those wars, uh, Jews um, were given the privilege of not being drafted, and uh, that continued apparently into the empire. So Jewish citizens uh, were apparently not uh, liable for conscription. Uh, that was um, not necessarily true of Christians, although you would think that since Christianity was illegal and, in fact, a capital crime, that you wouldn't find Christians in the military or in the government or associated with the Roman state. But, in fact, you do. I mean... Uh, there's lots of evidence that uh, before Constantine there were Christians in the army. Um, and even though Jews uh, were not conscripted, there's also evidence that uh, Jews served in the Roman army as individuals. Um, and there's also the, the case of the Samaritans who served in Judea and the Roman army. Um, there's no... Jewish unit, a unit called Jewish, until the late empire. There's a unit that's a little enigmatic. It's called the Royal Emesson Unit of Jews. It's not really clear. People argue about whether it was actually Jews or not. But um, 
Then also uh, there's the so-called uh, Lightning Legion, the 12th Lightning Legion, which uh, under Marcus Aurelius, uh, there's a, one version of a legend where they were entire, entirely made up of Christians, which is unlikely, but it's possible there were Christians in that unit. But there were, there were never units called Christian units, although, of course, under Constantine, then um, he gives his soldiers a Christian symbol, uh, and uh, after Constantine and under his successors in general, uh, Christians were favored in the army until finally in the 5th century, around 400, uh, Jews are expelled from the military, as well as the government. Now, what's interesting is uh, they have to repeat that several times. I mean, some people think that it was just a formality, that they're being expelled from the government and they added it to the military. But there's some reason to think that um, that there were actually maybe considerable numbers of Jews um, in the military and, uh, by the late empire. So, um, you know, there's not a lot of evidence um, for the Jews. There's more evidence for them serving in the earlier periods, say in the first, second century AD, uh, for the Christians, of course, for the later periods. But uh, you do seem to get Christians in the army, um, very early. Uh, you know, I mean, of course, one of the first first converts to Christianity is a Roman centurion. But uh, although you would think, because the Christians, uh, you know, uh, were illegal, that they wouldn't be there, they're in fact there. I mean, the, it, it shows the difference between the way things were supposed to be, sort of in theory, and the way they were in fact. Well, since um, you're an expert on, on military history and, and war throughout history, um, do you know of any pacifist groups within the Jewish community or the Christian community? Um, a lot of Christians would say that Jesus was a pacifist, but now there's been, um, you know, some of the passages have been reinterpreted by um, liberation theology as that he was actually, um, in some cases, asking for people to rebel against the Romans. And then there's also been some theories from from authors saying that he was a salad. Um But... Specifically, um, is it true that the Essenes were pacifistic? And then what about what what types of Christians were avoiding uh, being involved with the Roman army? Yeah. Well, I mean, you sort of have to distinguish um, the refusing to have anything to do with the Romans with being a pacifist. So the, uh, the Essenes say an example, um, or at least uh, what we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls and this from question about whether the Dead Sea Scrolls would reflect Essenes, Essenes or some other group, but whatever. I mean, if you read their, their testimony, it's very clear that, um, you know, they, they don't want to have anything to do with the Romans, who they call the Kitim, um, or even the Jewish authorities, who they look at as basically puppets of the Romans, and uh, that's why they go out in the desert, they separate themselves. But they're not pacifists. In fact, they're looking forward to this cataclysmic war in which they'll participate against, um, uh, you know, the, the forces of evil, who they really think of as the Romans and the, presumably the Jews who are not one of them. Uh, zealots, you know, um, you know, clearly would not have anything to do with the Romans, uh, but they were not, obviously not pacifists, they fought both against the Romans and other Jews. So, um, but there, there were, um, you know, if you, if you read in um, the Talmud, you know, the Talmud really doesn't talk about war fighting very much, um, you know, and generally when it does, it's sort of referring back to the biblical period, you know, when there was an actual Jewish army. Um, and so there, there's not a lot of talk about pacifism per se, in Judaism, because oddly, although, you know, most Jews didn't serve in the military, um, there was a very, very unusual thing after the fall of the Jewish state, you know, when uh, the Romans took over. Um, you know, the, the Jews, Jewish religion uh, always recognizes war and, and indeed just war and holy war as, as realities. I mean, they they were more theoretical because the Jews didn't actually do it because they didn't have a state, but, uh, but they were, were there. Now, Christianity is quite different. If you 
indicate, you know, it, it's possible to look at, you know, what's attributed to Jesus and the Gospels and the letters of the early Christians and writings and have very uh, different views of what Jesus wanted and what the Christian should do, you know, from, you know, fighting the Romans to, you know, not fighting anyone. So, um, you know, it's, it, I can't say, I don't think anyone can say what Jesus, you know, whether he was a pacifist or a zealot. I mean, it's, it's possible to interpret it both ways. But what we do know is that there were, if there were Christians that served in the Roman army and certainly didn't see anything contradictory between being a Christian and fighting, um, there certainly were, most Christians in the early years absolutely would not have anything to do with the, with the government. Well, in a way, that wasn't a choice because <laughs> they couldn't uh, mm-hmm. serve openly. So, um, but uh, you know, we do find groups like the Donatists. Uh, you know, once um, Constantine comes along, and you have this marriage of the Christian Church and the Roman state. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, there's really a, a strong reaction against that, and, and the Donatists you know, uh, revolt, you know, I mean, they're not pacifistic about it. They revolt against this idea of joining the Roman state, and they're slaughtered, really, by by actually Christian soldiers in, in large part. Um, but there are, um, you know, Christian pacifists. There are people who say you can't, uh, you know, uh, fight. And indeed, the, the whole martyr movement, in a way, uh, martyrs become very important in Christianity, um, reflect this, you know, willingness to die for God. And, and, and it comes really also out of the Jewish tradition. You know, Jews, if, if uh, you're, you're going to be killed, you know, scholars or, and you have saints who don't, um, don't fight back, you know, the idea is almost to seek death uh, as a witness to, to God. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you do, it, pacifism, as we understand it, exists in the ancient world. Hon- honestly, it's most seen among the Greeks, I mean, among Greek philosophers. And, of course, both Jews and Christians are influenced by Greek philosophy. Uh, but pacifism in all three traditions is, you know, what I say is um, what we think of pacifism, actually kind of unusual. Same with um, the rejection of slavery. Um, you know, there are, most strongly among the pagans, really a rejection of slavery. I mean, it's rare to find either Jewish or I don't even know of any uh, Jewish writers in antiquity or, or even Christian writers that reject slavery. But it was known. I mean, the idea was known that slavery was somehow wrong. That, but, uh, but both those ideas, what we would think of as, you know, equality or pacifism, democracy, you know, they were known in the ancient world, but, uh, but unusual. And that, that could be said also of Judaism and Christianity in those days. Can you tell us a little bit more about the relationship of the Jewish historian Josephus to both fighting against the Roman army and then fighting with them? And why would the Romans allow someone to change teams? Because would they be able to trust someone who used to fight against them? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, Josephus, I mean, is, you know, both one of our best sources and witnesses because, you know, he not only was an eyewitness, he served on both sides, which gave him a remarkable insight into a war. Um, and uh, he was, uh, uh, his writings survive in part because he writes about Jesus, and he writes about James, Jesus' brother. And, and um, so uh, the Christian church, he's, you know, uh, retained his writing. He wrote in Greek. Uh, he's completely unknown or practically unknown uh, in Jewish uh, history uh, until the Middle Ages. And um, so he's not really known in the Jewish tradition. Um, and he's uh, in modern times when he sort of gets rediscovered. And uh, he's very controversial, obviously, partly because he changes sides. And um, people have various views. My own view is um, that uh, he came from a very upper class um, background. He, he was a member of the priesthood. In fact, the priesthood was divided into what, what are called courses, which are basically clans, and, and some clans were higher than others. He comes from the highest, and he's related to the royal family, the last royal family, the second last, actually, the Hasmonean family. Uh, so obviously, very well-placed, you know, person, um, 
And, uh, you know, when the war started, it appears to have started among priests. And so it was not unusual to find a priest like Josephus um, being involved. On the other hand, it's also clear that there, you know, quickly the, the sort of upper class priests who were uh, the initial revolt um, were overcome by leaders of the Zealots, of the Sicarii, of the Idumeans, of other groups. Uh, who were not only hostile to the Romans, who were hostile to the, to the upper class. And so the nature of the revolt changed. Um, nevertheless, you know, Josephus uh, stayed up in Galilee. It's very interesting to read his writings. You know, there are certain contradictions in them. And his, he has two accounts in his autobiography and then in his book, The Jewish War. But, you know, he talks about not only fighting the Romans, but having to negotiate with the government in Jerusalem, fighting forces that were clearly not under his control. You know, the Civil War, its urgency is very complicated. Um, and and I, when I mentioned Civil War, I should point out that, um, you know, there were Jews on both sides of this. So King Herod Agrippa, who was a client king, he didn't control Jerusalem, but he controlled other parts of the area. Um, he had an army of made up of Jews. And they fought on the Roman side. So early in the revolt, about 10% of the Roman forces were Jews. Uh, and um, so, you know, it, it, when you talk about, you know, why would the Romans trust him? I mean, the Romans had Jews who were fighting on their side, you know, like Agrippa. In fact, Tiberius uh, Julius Alexander, who was a very, um, kid from a very high-ranking family in Egypt, his uh, uncle was Philo, the well-known philosopher, um, he served in the Roman army. He was a high-ranking officer in the Roman army. So there were Jews who were on the Roman side already. Um, Josephus um, is defending the town, um, Yodafat, Yodapada, and uh, he is hiding in a cave. And he, you know, it's interesting, the story does not reflect well on Josephus, although you know, he tells the story, which you have to give him some credit for that. Um, uh, how they all agree to commit suicide, and then he and this other guy um, are surviving, and then Josephus convinces this other person to surrender to the Romans. And there's a, a story, I mean, it actually is a modern story. This is not an ancient story that uh, that he somehow fixed uh, the, the lots that they took, the, the random lots that they took to decide who would commit suicide. But... Uh, Personally, I look at it differently. I mean, Josephus actually thought of himself, it appears, uh, as a kind of prophet. I mean, there, you know, uh, technically there were no prophets anymore in Judaism. The prophecy had been ended. But, you know, people did still feel that they got messages from God and, uh, through dreams and other things. And, and it's clear that um, Josephus, I think, um, believed that he had gotten messages from God. And I think that if we think of him randomly being spared, right, I mean, it's terrifying. You know, you're, you're drawing lots to decide who to die, and then you don't. Um, my view is, and, uh, you know, some people agree with this and some don't, that, uh, that he really didn't fix this or anything, that he really was quite struck by the fact that he survived uh, and um, that he took that as a sign, and that God had had spared him in order to save the temple. And um, as a priest, you know, the temple was really important. He felt that the um, the revolt had been hijacked by people who were polluting the temple, and whose resistance to the Romans, continued resistance to the Romans, would uh, ultimately lead to the temple's destruction. And, and he was right about that, actually. So um, he goes over. Now, the Romans don't immediately trust him. <laughs> he's uh, put in irons. He's put in prison, you know. And then uh, the story, he tells the story, how he went to uh, Vespasian, the Roman general, and prophesied, again, acting as a prophet, uh, that Vespasian would become emperor. And now that sounds like a kind of made-up story, but uh, in fact we have another Roman source that mentions the story. You know, so it's apparently true. And uh, that impressed Vespasian, and that resulted in Josephus being uh, released. And at that point, um, you know, 
maybe partly because of Tiberius Julius Alexander, who was on Vespasian staff, you know, um, Josephus was a well-known character. Everybody knew Joseph, who was inside Jerusalem, which was now being besieged. Everybody knew Josephus. I mean, he was a very well-known person. And, of course, he knew people inside personally. And so he could address them. His mother, in fact, his family was still in the city. And um, so, you know, he took on this role of, of trying to convince the people in the city to surrender. And I think in that he was quite... Um, he was quite uh, sincere. Uh, I think at that point, it was clear that, you know, Jerusalem was going to fall, that the temple would be destroyed. You know, Josephus insists it was an accident, but, you know, whether it was or not, I mean, it was, um, you know, not an unlikely uh, result of the end of the siege. So um, I think he was motivated in part by a feeling he was a messenger of God to save the temple and that the Romans had, become, in a sense, or maybe he had realized that the Romans were an instrument of God's punishment of the Jews in the same way as the Assyrians and the, the Babylonians had been. Yeah. So, um, now, the, the part of um, why and how did Josephus write his book? So, you know, his, he, he not only is spared, he's actually uh, rewarded by the Romans. He's um, given Roman citizenship, he's allowed to keep his property in Judea, and none of the other Roman Jewish uh, aristocrats are allowed to keep their property. Um, he's able, you know, a lot of Jews were enslaved and sentenced to death. He's allowed to pick out people, friends, and relatives, you know, spare them. He goes to Rome, apparently is patronized by Vespasian Titus. He dedicates his book to them. And, and says he sent copies to them, you know, for corrections and so forth. So he's obviously very close to the imperial family. He gets Roman citizenship. And uh, in Roman custom law, you, you took the name, if you were a foreigner and you became a citizen through someone's patronage, you took that family person's name, and he takes the name of the emperor, Flavius. And so uh, he's obviously very well placed, lives in Rome apparently. Most people claim he doesn't go back to Judea, although there's really no evidence that he didn't. Uh, but in any case, um, he probably lives in Rome. Now, um, that makes, of course, his writings very suspect because he's, you know, close to the imperial family, you know, and so he's often portrayed as a kind of propagandist. And certainly, I mean, you know, he um, is uh, writing from the, at that point, Roman perspective, but he's intensely Jewish, and I think his idea that um, you know, the revolt had been a tragic error, you know, particularly writing years later when the temple was lying in ruins and that it had been um, brought about by fanatics and, and zealots, people he hated, Sakari. Um, you know, I, I don't think he was lying. I think he actually was quite convinced that those people had, had brought about the destruction of of uh, not only the temple, but of course the people too, uh, you know, the destruction of uh, you know, death and enslavement of people. So um, there's another actually twist to this, and this has come out fairly recently in the work of an Israeli uh, archaeologist. Um, there's a famous series of coins uh, called the Judea Capta coins, so Judea, Judea conquered, and they show a Roman standing over a woman seated, that's Judea, under a palm tree, symbolizing the conquest of Judea. And in addition, you know, you have the Arch of Titus, which is in the Roman form. You can still go there and see it, and it shows the um, golden paraphernalia from the temple, the menorah, the, the, the table of the showbread, uh, being paraded in, into the forum, and, and they were deposited in the Temple of Jupiter. So, you know, the, the Romans, um, you know, celebrated a triumph over the Jews, and they celebrated the, this triumph in coinage. Well, um, this archaeologist, Gil Gambash, has pointed out, he, there's a, he, he wrote an article about a new coin that's been discussed, a very unusual coin, it's a gold coin, and it doesn't say um, Judea Capta, it says uh, Judea Recapta. And what that means is uh, Judea received back, uh, not conquered, but, you know, reincorporated. And this coin was um, 
minted not by the Romans, but by Herod Agrippa. And uh, so uh, uh, Gambage wrote a, a very series of, a series of articles that I find very convincing. And he points out that the Romans normally, if there was a revolt against the Romans, uh, and it, it, you, know, you would think that they would um, you know, put up a triumphal arch or uh, make a triumph or, or, or issue coinage that would celebrate their putting down this revolt because they would want to advertise that if you revolt against us, you'll be destroyed. Well, that never happened. You know, you, you couldn't uh, put up a triumphal arch. They never did that against the people who had been reconquered. Uh, they didn't put out coins to celebrate people being reconquered. And capta, that word capta, doesn't mean reconquered. It means conquered. And so what Amish argues, and I think there's a, a, something to be said for this, is that in order to justify his becoming emperor, Vespasian, you know, his, and his son, Titus, said their big achievement, besides defeating the other warlords who were trying to become emperors, the big achievement was defeating the Jews. Well, that was a real achievement in Roman terms if the Jews were a foreign people. Now, we think that's very strange, because we know that from 63 B.C., you know, the Romans had dominated Judea, and, and certainly from 6 AD, they had, you know, had a governor there, Pontius Pilate was the governor, and so forth. And so it seems strange that the Romans would pretend that uh, they were conquering a people. But, you know, uh, Judea actually floats in and out of Roman control. In fact, uh, uh, under Claudius, uh, for a while, he brought the king back. You know, they had the governor, then they had the king and the governor. So, you know, from the Roman perspective, they could at least pretend that although they had been administering Judea, perhaps, or influencing Judea, that in fact, it, it was always an independent state, um, and they were now conquering it for the first time in 70 AD. And what he says is that maybe this coin, and maybe Josephus' writing itself, is an attempt to present a sort of alternate view. You know, you don't read Josephus. Josephus doesn't make it very clear that, that Judea was under Roman rule. He makes it very clear that this is a revolt against the Romans. He makes it very clear that there were uh, Jews, including ultimately himself, who, like Herod, he has a big speech where Herod gives, warning the Jews not to revolt against the Romans. So what he's emphasizing is, there were loyal Jews, and it's just some of the Jews that were disloyal, and they were punished, rightly so. Uh, but we were always loyal members of the empire. So perhaps, and you know, this is a new view, and it's a young scholar, and I, uh, I'm, I'm not saying this is what most people think, but I think that he's really onto something. That, uh, in fact, uh, Josephus doesn't re represent sort of a slavish uh, propagandizing, but an attempt to actually influence uh, imperial policy, and what was ultimately a failed attempt, because, of course, uh, you know, the Romans did treat uh, the Jews as a conquered people, and they uh, did put up this triumphal arch. In this show, we, we discuss um, all, kind of, all kinds of different subjects, and one thing that came up in another podcast is there was a book written, and there's even a documentary uh, narrated by Susan Sarandon, where they say that Josephus wrote the Gospels, or even all of the New Testament. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you're familiar with them. Hmm. Um, I would say that that is not something that is taken seriously by any scholar that I've ever heard of. Um, you know, I mean, one can, I mean, I've heard of that theory, um, and I think it's based on certain similarities between Josephus and the Gospels, but that's just because um, they were writing around the same time and to some extent drawing on the same sources and writing about the same thing. But there's absolutely no reason to think that Josephus had anything to do with the Gospels. Or And, um, yeah, the, the answer is, Speaking as a as a scholar, there's um, there's really no reason to think that. I mean, uh, you know, one of the features of such um, theorizing, and you know, you could argue that aliens 
uh, wrote the Gospels. But, uh, you know, you can always say, is it possible? Well, you know, anything is possible. And, uh, you know, the fact is we're very unsure about much. Part of that uh, is we're unsure who wrote uh, most of the New Testament. You know, um, it's attributed to various people. You know, most people think that certain parts of the letter, most of the letters of Paul, perhaps you know, one, uh, maybe two of the letters of Peter, you know, were written by those people. Um, other parts, not so much. You know, there's a lot of argument in the Gospels. You know, there are some people that hold that, uh, you know, especially John or, you know, maybe even some of the synoptic Gospels may have been written by people. Uh, you know, those people that claim to be like Luke, you know, and other people deny that. So, you know, I mean, there's uncertainty about the authorship, but I think one thing that can be very, uh, you know, securely stated, as securely as you can state anything, is that Josephus had nothing to do with it, or Philo or anyone else. Yeah, the, they were saying that uh, there's some similarities between the idea of being a... Uh, fishers of men and them finding so many dead people in the Sea of Galilee and, and fishing them out during the war and the, the things like that? Well, you know, this is uh, what we call um, argument by analogy, you know. And, uh, you, know, so, you know, you can often find similarities between two texts or two pictures or two something that may suggest connection, but, you know, it's not enough in of itself, and and also remember, you know, the the Gospels and and you know Josephus are contemporary, right? And they're in the same part of the world, and they both exist in this intersection between the Jewish uh, culture and Greek and Roman culture. So you know, obviously, I mean, if they didn't have similarities, it would be very surprising, right? Um, but similarities are not the same as authorship. So, you know, the fact that they're using the same metaphors, the fact that they're writing about the same thing, maybe even using the same language and things like that, that's not surprising. But that, you know, doesn't say anything. I mean, the fact is that other, you know, here's the thing, you know, other than what Josephus wrote himself, right, which is quite a bit, I mean, he gives us a lot of information about himself, um, you know, we don't know anything about Josephus. I mean, Josephus is mentioned in um, Suetonius, but anonymously, you know, not by name. And, you know, um, and there, there we have no other real, and he's just confirming something that we read in Josephus anyway. Um, as far as the early Christianity is concerned, you know, the, we have very, very little information. So anytime you have very little evidence, there's lots of room to, you know, make theories, right? But, uh, yeah, I mean, is there any reason to think that? Or that anyone else picked at random from the ancient world wrote the Gospels? No. Well, and the only reason I bring it up is because we like to debunk uh, conspiracy theories and the, the work at school, Caesar's Messiah, and I wanted to get your, your perspective on it. Um, re regarding, um, in the lecture you mentioned that 20% of the Egyptian army under Cleopatra was Jewish. Um, I know in, in Judaism there's there was an aspect of not returning to Egypt. So was there Jewish commu communities in in Egypt after the Exodus? And like how soon did they go back? Or? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's very interesting. I mean, in fact, not only was there a Jewish community, a Jewish community is very early. I mean, as early as the 7th century B.C., and in fact, there are Jews in, in Egypt, uh, wow, there's a Jewish state, you know, before the Babylonian exile, and certainly afterwards under the Persians, um, their military colony down at Elephantini is very famous, um, and uh, when the Greeks take over, the Ptolemies, uh, the Jews serve, uh, that 20% figure comes from a study done of papyri, you know, I mean, it's obviously not statistically significant, but, um, and, you know, the, the you know, it, it, it's 20% of the names that we have of Ptolemaic soldiers. And that's not just in the time of Cleopatra, but uh, we, we can list out of papyri people who are identified as soldiers and 20% of our names are, are Jewish or identified as Jews. So that, you know, that might be 
for other reasons. But the point is that a significant number, and in fact, under Cleopatra, the commander of the uh, Egyptian army, which of course was not the native Egyptian army, the Egyptians are, you know, um, themselves um, served only in very small numbers. And uh, uh, this was the Macedonian army uh, that ruled over Egypt. Cleopatra was not an Egyptian, she was a Macedonian. So, um, but in any case, um, you do have this biblical prohibition against going back to Egypt. Uh, and actually, there, the Jewish community in, in Alexandria was very, very large. You know, the big percentage of the population in Alexandria, the biggest synagogue in the world was in Alexandria. Uh, that community is, uh, is uh, expelled in the second century. But, uh, but how, you know, uh, how is that possible if, if God told them not to go back? So, you know, from a scholarly point of view, that's not that complicated because scholars generally think that, uh, you know, the Judaism, you know, as it exists, uh, you know, is a, is a, um, a product of not, you know, say even the Persian period, although some people put it back that far. But most people think that uh, Judaism, in, in the sense that you really had to follow you know, all these uh, prescriptions um, that most Jews did uh, is a product maybe of the Hellenistic period and some people even think the Roman period. So, um, you know, that prohibition existed probably for a long time, but that doesn't mean Jews were necessarily thought you had to follow it. Now, um, from the other perspective, I was actually had a, a, we have a little study session at our school last year with a rabbi, and we, he brought up this very issue. He had a whole little study session on on, uh, on this, because uh, from the religious point of view, it's a problem. You know, why? You know, clearly there were Jews in Egypt, and not just in ancient times. There were Jews in Egypt in the Middle Ages, right up to modern times. I mean, they were expelled, you know, after the State of Israel was, was created. But uh, how is that possible religiously? And he had various explanations. These are in the Talmud. You know, the Jews don't really follow the Old Testament, as the Christians do, they follow the Talmud, which is uh, the oral law, you know, I mean, obviously the, the written law is sacred, and you have to follow it, but you follow it in the way described by the Talmud, and there are various explanations in the Talmud about why, what, what God meant by prohibition, and why you can go to Egypt, right, so um, that's why, <laughs> basically, I, you know, wh whether those you know, I mean, the Talmud is written after the Jews have been back there, so it's not clear that those Jews actually had those same justifications, but ultimately there is a religious explanation for it. So speaking of inconsistencies, uh, you also mentioned that in the New Testament book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verse 1, uh, there's a mention of an Italian cohort in Caesarea of, of the Roman army, and that... Um, there's no evidence of that. Um, can you tell us more about it? Right. Yeah, there, you know, that's an yeah, interesting point. So um, Judea, as a, it wasn't really a province. And again, you know, the question is, is it really a sort of quiet state that's occupied, you know, administered by the Romans, or is it part of Syria? You know, from the, that's sort of a legal question. But, uh, but it had a military force. Um, up in, well, King Herod controlled it. You know, King Herod had an army that was made up of of Jews and Samaritans, and as I mentioned before, you know, Germans and all sorts of people. You know, uh, and then there was uh, when he died in 4 BC, there was a big revolt, and most of the army, um, certainly the Jewish part of the army, joined the revolt. And the Samaritans didn't. There were um, six cohorts, I believe, um, of Samaritans. And uh, as a reward for them not joining the revolt and staying loyal to the Romans, the Romans incorporated them into the Roman army. So those units, uh, these Samaritans, uh, stayed in Judea as part of the Roman garrison or maybe as the Roman garrison. There were no legions in the time of Jesus um, in Judea. The first legion was um, stationed there after the destruction of the temple. Uh, so these auxiliary units uh, were the garrison, and they were stationed in Caesarea, which is you know on the coast, which was the capital 
um, occasionally a cohort would be put in uh, in uh, uh, Jerusalem in the Antonia, which was the uh, tower next to the temple to sort of supervise it. So one of the things to understand, you know, when both Josephus uh, and the New Testament uh, talk about um, Roman soldiers, you know, um, and even this may include that centurion who um, yeah, is one of the first converts to Christianity, um, they're not necessarily talking about ethnic Romans, and in fact, uh, they may be Samaritans. You know, of course, Samaritans from the Roman point of view are Jews. You know, they're just a different type of Jew. And uh, now, um, the, the real question, you talk about the Augustan or uh, cohort, Italian cohort, partly whether those two, because there's two mentions, one to an Italian cohort, one of an of a, a, a Augustan cohort, are those the same cohort? Because sometimes... Uh, a cohort. I mentioned that they'd have ethnic things. You know, a, a Italian cohort was unusual. In other words, it was raised from Italians that would have been Roman citizens. So normally, a, a, a cohort uh, would have been non-Roman citizens. But there were Italian cohorts. Some of them, some auxiliary cohorts, were given this uh, honorary title Augustus. So you could be both Italian and Augustan. So there's one question is whether, you know, there were, this is a reference to one cohort under two different names or whether there were two different cohorts. And secondly, um, there's no contemporary evidence. There's no inscription or there are so-called diplomas which uh, list auxiliary units. There's no evidence of there being um, either the Augustan or the Italian cohort. Yet Josephus doesn't mention it, although he goes, he mentions these Samaritan cohorts quite a bit. Um, so this is the argument. Uh, there are scholars of ancient military history, in fact, of the ancient military history of, of Judea and this period, who do think that these cohorts mentioned in the New Testament are quite real. I personally don't. I think um, that uh, these are, you know, people who, you know, because it's following a theory that at least the Acts, you know, are written not in Judea but written in Syria, and they're written by people who. Are, it's after the fall of the temple, so they're not familiar with the way um, Judea was before, you know, in the time of Jesus. So it may have been that they're, he's talking about an Augustan legion, uh, Augustan cohort rather, that was stationed in Judea uh, after the fall of the temple. So that's the basic explanation. I mean, uh, the fact is we don't really know. I mean, uh, you know, it really comes down to um, a question of whether you believe the New Testament reflects uh, people who were living at or just after the time of Jesus uh, who knew what things were like, or if you think that at least some parts, like the Acts, um, were written by people later, how much later, but certainly after the fall of the temple and that they weren't in Judea, so they really didn't have first-hand knowledge of how things had been. And so the situation in Judea is quite different military situation, the garrison, is completely different after 70 and before 66 when the revolt started. So um, that's really the, the basic explanation. I took a class on um, early Christianity in Judaism, and every time I bring up the con the issue of anti-Judaism, even with scholars or, or my classmates, they always um, like shut it down. Like I... I I found evidence where there was anti-Judaism even before Christianity and that there was some type of discrimination from the Greeks and the Romans. And everybody always says that, oh, well, they discriminated everybody or they did not like other groups. And they and somehow it always gets washed away as like there was no particular hatred of the Jews at that time. It was either because of territory or because of whatever. Like they always try to like uh, dismiss it. Uh, do you see any evidence of anti-Judaism in the Roman army as they were bringing in Jews? And I know that there was Jews fighting on both sides, but was there any um, institutionalized or just even personal discrimination that, that you have seen? Yeah, I mean, it's very common. I mean, uh, well, I mean, you can certainly say that, you know, the Romans, Greeks discriminated, didn't like other people. They didn't like each other. You know, the Greeks didn't particularly like the Romans. The Romans didn't like the Greeks. They made fun of them. They had stereotypes about them. They discriminated against them. Upper class, 
people, discriminated against lower class people, and so forth. You know, um, but you know, you have to. Obviously, there were different points of view. Now, um, are there writings that that specifically target Jews for various reasons? Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, Josephus wrote a book against Appian, one of his uh, books. Uh, which is written specifically against Appian, who is a, has just written this book attacking the Jews from a Greek point of view. So clearly, there were in, you know entire books written attacking the Jews as Jews. Tacitus, who wrote, unfortunately, most of this is lost, but he began part of his fifth book of his histories to write about um, the Jewish war, and he begins with a with an introduction to who the Jews are, and is very hostile to Jews. I mean, it's uh, he does not like Jews. Other Roman writers, um, you know, like satirical writers, obviously don't like Jews. They have prejudice against Jews. Uh, but the prejudices were different in some ways. I mean, first of all, um, they weren't religious, of course. You know, the idea of Jews as Christ killers, or things like that. There were specifically Christian ideas of anti-Semitism, which, of course, didn't exist among the pagans. But um, but on the other hand, modern ideas like that Jews uh were greedy, or that Jews were good with money, or that Jews, um, you know, uh, look differently, or smell differently, or talk differently. Uh, that didn't exist in ancient times. You know, that they what they criticized was that Jews um, didn't eat pork, that they were lazy because they didn't work on the Sabbath. Uh, they were atheists because they didn't believe in the gods. You know, they you know didn't kind of understand the idea of one God. That same made same complain about the Christians. Um, now, they did accuse the Jews of, of, of being misanthropic, you know, sticking among themselves, because quite honestly, you know, Jews who follow the laws of, of Kashrut and, you know, uh, are in purity, don't eat with non-Christians. You know, I mean, uh, non-Jews, rather. So, I mean, that was true then, and it's true now. I mean, uh, and, you know, you invite somebody over to dinner, uh, and they don't uh, eat <laughs> with you, um, you know, they bring their own food or whatever. They won't come in because you have pork in the house or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, people will naturally uh, interpret that as, as being unfriendly. So, uh, yeah, that that's similar. But a lot of the modern ideas about Jews, you know, Jews controlling the empire or whatever, that was not something the ancients had. Now, the Christians, you know, have other ideas about the Jews, and but those, those revolve around the you know, how they differentiate themselves from Jews and then blame Jews for, for the death of Christ and, and, and for rejecting Christ. But that's a, that's different from the pagans. They weren't, they didn't really care that the Jews didn't believe in Zeus. That didn't bother them. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Thank you for listening. We will be back next week with another episode of The Mystic and the Skeptic. Show descriptions and content are available online on our Facebook page. We would like to thank Radio Free Nashville for their technical guidance and assistance. I know I ain't been here for a long time. Doing better on my own now, it's my time. It's what I chose, it's what I own, it's my life. Last time I checked and looked it up, it's all mine. I know I ain't been here for a long time. Doing better on my own now, it's my time. It's what I chose, it's what I own, it's my life. Last time I checked and looked it up, it's all mine. I'm on line, I'm on track, I'm just fine. I may find when I look back, it's all mine. I may find when I think about it, it's all mine. See the choice is yours to unlock the force Telekinesis That Christ conscious is always constant We are Jesus But we're born in a world torn into fragments and pieces More tragedy in this reality Imagine where peace is lost Now it's up to us No ifs and buts No matter the cost Cause we're the cause Free from the loss and from above